So I wanted to talk to you a bit about the process of putting this together and also introduce to you about the context of the Smithsonian as well. Um, so incidentally, this photograph on the left is my father. This is when he was getting ready to leave the United States, or to leave India to come to the United States. That was taken in 1965 in Bombay. Um, so Beyond Bollywood, Indian Americans Shape the Nation um, is currently showing at the Smithsonian until August 16th. As I mentioned, it's a 5,000 square foot gallery. And I'm going to intersperse some images of the actual um, exhibition throughout my talk so that you can see uh, some of the gallery itself. Um, so the purpose of the exhibition is really to explore the contributions that Indian immigrants and Indian Americans have, been ma have made to shaping the United States politically, professionally, and culturally from the 1700s to the present. Many people think that Indian immigration um, dates back to the 1960s here in the United States, and it actually goes back quite a bit further than that to the founding of this country. I often tell people when we're walking through the gallery that um, many Indians that I encounter, if I ask them, they still consider themselves to be foreigners. And when I tell them that we've been here since um, the history books tell us that the 1790s, actually, which is just 14 years after the founding of the United States, it puts into a different context what the word foreigner actually means because we've been a, been a part of shaping this country's history for most of its duration. 
Um, so a little bit about the Smithsonian. Um, it was founded in 1846. It's almost 170 years old. And many people think it's just one museum, but it's in fact 19 different museums covering uh, natural history, art, culture, and also the sciences. Um, each museum has up to 10 million visitors annually, and this is really important because those of us who put exhibitions together, we want people to see them. That's um, why we do them, in fact. And these visitors um, span not only audiences from across the United States, but around the world. And for many people who visit the Smithsonian, it's often one of their first entryways into understanding America and our history. And so um, it's wonderful to be, ha to be able to have an exhibition about Indian immigration within these museums. Um, it's open 364 days a year and is free to the public, which I think is also very important given that most museums um, are charging higher and higher fees and those are prohibitive for a lot of people to be able to visit. One of our mandates is the telling of American history and all of its nuance and diversity. And as curators, we're constantly excavating and unearthing and creating and rewriting new history to be able to do this. Um, we've always been a country of immigrants since our founding, but much of the history that's told in textbooks that people will learn as children growing up, or even the history that's told through the popular media doesn't include the history of many communities who've been part of this country and shaped it to be what it is. Um, and incidentally, beyond Bollywood, Indian Americans Shape the Nation is the Smithsonian's first look at the contributions of Indian immigrants and Indian Americans. This is remarkable, considering it's a 170-year-old institution. So it's actually been a long time coming. Um, so the project that is the umbrella project for Beyond Bollywood is called the Indian American Heritage Project, and it began in 2007. There were a number of local Indian community members in the DC area who approached the institution and said, you know, we've been coming here for years. We've brought our children and our grandchildren, but we've never seen any of our own histories on these walls, and we would love to be able to do that. So they offered the Smithsonian um, not only some money to be able to start the project, but also they shared their own things that they had saved, documents, newspaper clippings, photographs, um, and they, they gave their own interviews of their lives and their experiences in the United States, and that's what started the project. It took us seven years to be able to collect the information um, to put in the gallery, which opened in 2014. We went around the country and talked to people. We worked with scholars. We looked in archives. Um, we visited newspaper collections as well as photographic collections. Um, and we borrowed things, some of which were from other museums and universities, and some of which were from people and their families. We went into attics and basements and drawers. Um, so this was really an effort of canvassing around the country to be able to put this together. Um, as I said, the exhibition in Washington is a 5,000 square foot gallery containing a combination of images, objects, and works of art. Um, all of the works of art are done by Indian artists who are living and working in the United States. And I'll show you a couple of examples later in the presentation. Um, up to 15 million people will see Beyond Bollywood in person. And one of the things that's really amazing is that um, in its during its showing, many Indians have come to see it. but. More than that, non-Indians have come to see it. And most people these days have an Indian coworker or a classmate or neighbor or a friend, or they have children um, who play with you know, children that are part of an Indian family. Or they know India through things like food or fashion or the films. Um, but the history kind of beyond that or deeper than that really doesn't get told. And so this is a way not just for Indians, but for the broader American public and the international public to be able to understand who we are as a community. Um, over 90% of people who visit the gallery are not Indian. And so it's been um, one, of, one of our goals is really to educate people in the broader public about who we are as a community. Um, also, the US State Department decided to take a version of the exhibition to India in um, autumn of 2014. And we translated the exhibition into several languages and toured it around the country. It's, in fact, still touring. 
um, in a number of different cities. And one of the things that they've been interested in seeing is how the um, Indians in India respond to the diaspora here in the United States in our history. And towards the end, I'll show you um, a small essay that we put together that, that uh, details that tour. Um, the exhibition is also traveling around the United States as um, the Smithsonian has made a commitment to taking things beyond Washington, D.C. and being able to show them in communities around the country and having communities be able to personalize and localize the exhibition through things that are relevant to the actual context. So the next showing is actually here in Fremont. Um, it opens on August 1st and will show through the 10th of October. Um, it's then going to travel a little bit on the West Coast before going to the Midwest and to the South. And it will be traveling through 2020. Um, we're also working on creating a curriculum that's going to be a web-based uh, curriculum that can be used by parents and children or teachers and students where people can learn some of the history. Um, this is also going to be important for archival purposes after the exhibition goes down in August. Um, so as I mentioned, we went around the country to find things um, to be able to put in the exhibition. The Smithsonian, in addition to what it displays, collects things that are of national significance. And we have more than 137 million objects in the national collection. It includes everything from documents to works of art to fossils and bones and insects and living animals um, to historical objects that are of significance um, to our national story. But one of the things that was really interesting when we started this project was that there was not a single item that could be tagged to Indian immigrants in the United States. We do have things from India in our collection. We have works of art, we have garments, we have textiles. Um, but we didn't have anything that was of significance to this community, or at least anything that could be tagged as such. Those of you who work in data know that we can only find things to the sensitivity that they are actually labeled, right? So those of us as curators, we don't have a single warehouse, as you imagine, with 137 million objects. They're stored in a number of different places. And some of them actually can't be exposed to much air and humidity because they're so delicate. Um, so we have to rely on the metadata that was entered um, when the digital record was created. And in some cases, it's very um, that's very sparse. So. We had to go out and find things to put in the exhibition. Um, so we did national calls for oral histories, for documents, for archival materials, photographs, objects, and props. And we spread the word through social media, emails, websites, uh, word of mouth, community organizations, and also on university campuses. I have to say that we really just scratched the surface. We have a very small staff and reaching kind of all of the Indians in the United States and all their diversity was not, was not possible. So we did the best we could um, to reach out. And it was really one of the cases where the Smithsonian was relying heavily on crowdsourcing, which is a new curatorial methodology. It's not commonly used. Usually curators kind of have a vault or a collection that they're working with already. Um, and they're not really engaging with the public in the process of putting this together. And this was the opposite. We really had to go out and ask people um, to share things and to help us. Um, so one of the things that we asked for was family photographs. Um, we figured this was a way that many people could participate without necessarily having to have a lot of historical knowledge or you know feeling like whether or not their personal story was significant to national history so we asked people to send us photographs from their albums and now with digital technologies it's very easy to scan things in high resolution without having to actually let go of the initial or the original uh, document or photograph and so we got hundreds of photographs that were sent uh, to us from around the country. Some of them were as old as 1900, and some of them were taken on a digital camera several weeks before we issued the call. Um, and one of the photographs that came to us was from this family in Los Angeles, and this picture was taken in 1983, when um, a few years after they had come to the United States, and they were on vacation in San Francisco looking at the Golden Gate Bridge. 
Um, those of us who are curators look for an iconic image to be able to represent uh, the story that the exhibition is telling, and we chose this one as our iconic image because it is both about the specificity of this family, but because you can't see their faces. Um, it's also about every family. Many of us who grew up in this generation have a picture of, from a vacation that's pretty similar to this. Um, so this turned into the iconic image of the exhibition, which also turned into a 28-foot banner, which is hanging on the exterior of the, um, the Museum of Natural History on the National Mall. And I don't know how many of you have visited the National Mall, but it's a pretty powerful place to walk around. You see on one side the Washington Monument, and on the other side the Capitol, and then the Smithsonian's are within kind of a square uh, that encompasses that, and it's a pretty, you have a sense of history, and to see our own history as part of that physical space is a pretty moving thing. Another thing we collected was shoes. So I had a lot of kids who wanted to participate in the making of the exhibition, and they said, how can I share some of my stuff? Um, and the exhibition designer noticed when she visited a lot of Indian homes and other spaces, including worship spaces, that we always leave our shoes um, near the entrance. So she said, why don't we put shoes at the entrance to the exhibition gallery, and then people can take off their shoes if they want, or they can just look at the shoes that are there. Um, but a lot of children actually went through their family closets and sent us shoes, both Indian shoes and American shoes, to put in the exhibition. It was a way that we could have people of all ages participate um, in a way that wasn't very difficult. So. so here's a wall of a number of the family photographs that we received. Um, we included mirrors as part of the exhibition so that people, when they were walking by, could see themselves as part of the story that was on the walls. Um, these are some of the older family photographs that we received. And also in the center is a poem um, that was in the, the film that I showed you. It was written by poet Mina Alexander for the film, or for the exhibition. And one of the most wonderful things about putting this together is that I got a chance to work with so many creative Indian Americans around the country, and they shared you know, whatever was their art with the exhibition to be put in the Smithsonian. So um, it was great to be able to, to work with such individuals. This is a photograph um, that was also in the film. And the man in the center is Dalip Singh Sand. He was the first person that was elected to uh, the US Congress of Indian origin, and actually also of Asian origin and non-Abrahamic faith. He was elected in the 1950s and was a contemporary of these two men who were senators at the time, Lyndon B. Johnson and John F. Kennedy. This photograph was in the basement of his grandson, um, who had put it away in a box uh, for safekeeping. And when we went to his home in Palo Alto, he was like, do you think you might have use for this? And we said, yeah, <laughs> we think so. This, would be, this is a great piece of history. Uh, so I wanted to give you a few highlights from uh, the exhibition that, that might be things that are relevant to you kind of in your own fields and in your own lives. The first is that, um, as I mentioned earlier, Indians have been a part of the United States since its founding. A lot of times as a curator, I speak to the media and I speak to the general public, and most people have the perception that Indian immigrants started coming here in the 1960s and that all of us are doctors or engineers. Um, so I get asked this question, you know, why are there so many doctors and engineers? And we do explain that in the exhibition, but one of the things that I emphasize to people is that um, Indians have had their hands in a whole variety of occupations and have actually physically built this country to be what it is today. This is a picture from the Southern Oregon Historical Society. It's from 1906. And it's um, Punjabi immigrants who participated in building railroads along the West Coast. And again, this is something that is very little known about our own history, even amongst our own community. But it really changes our perceptions of our roots here. Um, so the second thing that I think is really interesting is that India's independence and rights for Indians in the United States are historically intertwined. Um, so initially, when Indian immigrants started coming here in the 1800s and 1900s, the US Census didn't really have a way to classify us. 
Um, we weren't, you know, part of a, a category of sort of white native foreign people, but the census also didn't have the number of categories, including the Asian Indian designation that it has now. And so for many years, just like a lot of immigrants who come initially, we sort of slipped through the cracks and we weren't kind of in any category. Um, but what happened in the 1920s is that people started applying for citizenship, including a man named Bhagat Singh Tind, who you saw in the film. Um, he served in the US Army during World War I, and after his term, he applied for citizenship. He was granted citizenship and had it revoked three separate times, and his case went all the way up to the Supreme Court um, in 1923, where he lost. And the decision from the Supreme Court at the time was that although he was of Caucasian race, he was not sufficiently white to be granted US citizenship. So that catalyzed a period of 23 years in US history between 1923 and 1946 when Indians could not become citizens of the United States. And if we think about that, that's not that long ago. Um, and a lot had to happen in those 23 years in order to shift that public policy and that legislation. So one of the things that happened was that the Indian immigrants at that time reasoned that as long as India was a British colony and India didn't have independence, that Indian immigrants in the United States would always be treated as second-class persons. So their strategy actually was to fight for Indian independence and push the US government to support Indian independence. And that was the roundabout way in which they felt like citizenship would be granted for Indians in the United States. So this is a photograph of gentlemen who were part of uh, an organization called the Gadda Party, which some of you may have heard of. It was actually founded in the early 1900s in Oregon. And their headquarters were in San Francisco. And what they did is they published and they lectured a lot about the cause of Indian independence. They published in English as well as a number of different Indian languages. And they got a lot of public intellectuals in the United States to support the cause of Indian independence. And eventually, they also went back to India. They raised money and they actually fought on the ground and protested and marched alongside the freedom fighters in India at the time. And um, shortly before India was granted independence in 1947, something called the Loose Seller Act was signed into law in 1946. And that gave citizenship rights to persons of not just Indian origin, but also Filipino origin as well. And so that was the piece of legislation that turned the corner. Um, also, I thought it might be interesting for you to know that the legacy of Indian innovation and entrepreneurship in the United States predates 1965. Um, these are two men who are part of that legacy. The person on uh, the right is a man named Rostam Ali. He came from what was Bengal at the time. It was the state of Bengal. This is pre-Indian independence and pre-partition. He came in the early 1900s. And he was part of um, a number of people who were working on British ships' crews at the time. And what happened is as these ships docked on various ports along the US East Coast, including New Orleans and Baltimore and New York, they jumped ship. They decided that they no longer wanted to work as servants to the British, and they settled in the communities in the communities along these ports. Many of these communities were actually African American or Puerto Rican in Louisiana. They were Creole communities. Um, and they intermarried with the women from these communities. And they started their own businesses and lines of trade. At that time in the US, as there is now, there was a fascination for what were called oriental goods, silks, spices, um, textiles things like that. And so they just they started the lines of trade with India at that point kind of on their own terms outside of sort of the British oversight. Um, and many of them, these are now fifth and sixth generation families, their descendants in the United States today. And the man on the left is Yela Pragada Subarao, and he came here in the early 1900s. And in the 1920s, um, he was a biochemist. And he helped um, 
the, the process of understanding ATP and ATP synthesis, and he also contributed to the development of what is now a very common anti-cancer drug, methotrexate. So this was all the way back in the 1920s when there wasn't you know, this large critical mass of Indians coming here for education or for work. Um, again, a little known part of our history. I also think as a curator that understanding our history is very important to our future. And one of the stories that we tell in the exhibition is about the H-1B visa, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with or you may even have, you may be holding or maybe working here on an H-1B visa. Does anyone know the history of how the H-1B visa No. Okay, so the H-1B visa was created during the Cold War in the 1980s, and it was because we were in an arms race with this, what was then the Soviet Union, and the United States, just as is the case today, did not have enough native-born and trained scientists and engineers to participate in the research and development efforts that were needed to support this arms race. So under those guises, the H-1B visa was created to recruit um, and people who could come to study here and to work here, specifically people with technical backgrounds, with engineering and the sciences, who could then participate in these research and development efforts. And what happened following that also was the Silicon Valley, was the development of the Silicon Valley, where some of these technologies that were first developed for use in military contexts and in defense contexts also you know, had other purposes. And so the H-1B visa is actually critical to um, the, the founding and the blossoming of the Silicon Valley as we know it. And it's, again, most people when they think about it today think about like quotas and jobs being taken or outsourcing. I mean, the contemporary debates around immigration focus on a few specific things and sort of ignore the history of what has enabled this country's economic growth for decades um, and what has kept it afloat when industries like manufacturing and agricultural industries have declined. So um, we talk about the history of the H-1B visa and one thing that I wanted to do because I work in the visual medium instead of just putting a visa up on the wall and framing it, which isn't very interesting. Um, we actually did a national call and we asked artists to use the H-1B visa to create works of art that were inspired by the experience of what it means to live here and work here with this particular visa. So there was a painter in New Jersey, Rui Gawariker, who is actually on an H-4 visa. Her husband came here on an H-1B visa several years ago. She was a painter in Bombay, and she, when she came here, she continued to paint. Um, I think her husband was on his sixth or seventh H-1B visa. They had gone through you know, all of these ups and downs, including the possibilities of being sent back. And so she painted this painting about her experience. It's called The Goddess of Visas. And in the painting, the goddess is conferring a visa on her followers who are, she's conferring not just a visa, but a mouse and a keyboard and some science textbooks um, for people who pray to her. And actually, I've taken a number of people through this exhibition, and they've told me there are a number of such visa temples in India where people can go if they really want the visa. So um, I didn't realize this you know, had resonance all the way across the world. But this is one way in which we use not just history, but also humor to provide some context to what's going on um, in current times in the United States. Um, and then finally, the story of Indians in America must be shared in India, and we had a chance to do that. So at the very end, um, I'm going to show you a bit about the tour that was there. So the public response, so far I just wanted to share that um, the Indian American community has been very invested um, in the exhibition. And as you can imagine, I always say whenever you put 10 Indians in a room, you get 30 opinions, some of which contradict each other. That's kind of normal <laughs> for our community. And so that's been the case with the exhibitions. Um, I've also been really curious to see the responses from the non-Indian public. And I think people have been, there have been much fewer stereotypes 
than I thought uh, I would encounter. I think people's understanding of our community and its diversity and its complexity is really growing. Um, and hopefully this exhibition has, been, has taken a step towards that. Um, we've also had a lot of people that visit as multiple generation, grandparents, parents, and children. And um, it's been great to see that because even children growing up in the United States today won't encounter any of this information in their textbooks. Um, it's just we are far behind um, in terms of our study of American history to be able to include uh, the history of all the communities here. So there's been a lot of, um, it's been a sense of a source of pride to be able to see that. So what's next? Um, a version of the exhibition is traveling and those of you who live in the Bay Area, it's actually going to be here in Fremont and Santa Rosa through the beginning of next year, and then is going to other cities around the country, including Bloomington, Indiana, St. Paul, Minnesota, Raleigh, North Carolina, and Columbia, South Carolina. If you have any interest in bringing it to your city, it is traveling until 2020, and we have many more slots available, so you can visit uh, the website that I've listed to find out more information, or you can contact me as well, and I'd be happy to give you those details. So with that, I just wanted to close by uh, sharing a video about the tour in India. Do you have sound? Beyond Bollywood, Indian Americans Shaped the Nation, created by the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center. Beyond Bollywood is showing at the National Museum of Natural History until August 16, 2015, and a version of it will begin touring around the United States in May this year. Last autumn, the exhibition and I also traveled to India for a tour organized by the U.S. Department of State. The exhibition is now part of ongoing cultural diplomacy between the U.S. and India, which dates back to India's independence in 1947. Diplomacy between the two world's largest democracies is receiving increased attention these days, given new leadership, regional security concerns, nuclear geopolitics, and trade opportunities. What does it mean to be a cultural diplomat? I went to India to explore this question. Historically, cultural diplomacy has emphasized persuasion. Harvard political scientist Joseph Nye defines it as, quote, the ability to persuade through culture, values, and ideas, as opposed to hard power, which coerces through military might, end quote. Some say that cultural diplomacy dates back to the 7th and 8th centuries when China sent its porcelain to Europe. Jazz tours were part of cultural diplomacy sponsored by the CIA in the 1950s. And during the Cold War, when official channels were closed, American museums mounted exhibitions in Moscow to create new understandings of America within Russia. In India, Beyond Bollywood opened its tour at the American Center in New Delhi. The center serves as a place for visitors to learn about American history, culture, and values as well as opportunities for studying and working here. At the exhibition's opening reception, Ambassador Kathleen Stevens and I lit lamps, a tradition to mark auspicious occasions in India. As I posed for photos, I wondered about my role as cultural diplomat. Was I supposed to be simply showing the exhibition panels to visitors and recapping its content to reporters? Or was there something more? After the initial pageantry, the hubbub gave way to people-to-people -people conversations at the American Center and in my speaking engagements in galleries and universities around India. The exhibition served as a point of departure for deeper conversations. For example, 
Artists and activists shared ideas about how to raise public consciousness by addressing controversial topics in their work. Journalists and historians were interested in my curatorial process as they figured out how to better tell their own stories. Perhaps 21st century diplomacy is about conversation rather than persuasion. In fact, perhaps it has always been this way, especially for curators. With each engagement during the tour, it occurred to me that curators have long been cultural diplomats, even from our offices. As we make exhibitions, we converse across borders, explore each other's archives, and share our ideas and our objects. In fact, some would argue that exhibitions themselves are a form of solidarity, including in instances where governments aren't in alignment with each other. In this way, Museums are transnational organizations with global responsibilities. Individuals in India confided in me that they came to see the exhibition because, although they take issue with U.S. government policies and assumed many cultural programs to be propaganda, they see the Smithsonian as neutral and scholarly. As this newspaper article indicates, it means something of significance when the Smithsonian explores history, art, and culture. Although we certainly aim to be scholarly, the Smithsonian still has subjectivity. We are charged with national expressions of identity and work daily to make these expressions more inclusive. Abroad, this takes on a different tenor. The Smithsonian is a physical manifestation of America, similar to the way that material objects are stand-ins for persons who they are biographically connected to. This is not to say that the public receives our work without skepticism. On the contrary, just as in America, the public in India did not want to be simply talked at. They wanted to engage and to interrogate, as was the case with the 60,000 visitors who came to see Beyond Bollywood during its four-day showing in Kolkata. Diplomacy usually occurs between nations, but more than ever in the 21st century, people, ideas, and cultures are transnational, and they transcend state interests. As people who work at the intersection of the textual and the visual, and the material and the conceptual, and who are often forced to make categories and coherence out of complexities, curators are and have long been cultural diplomats. I learned this by taking Beyond Bollywood to India. or do we need to wrap up? Okay. Oh, there's questions. Okay. <laughs> I've got one right here. Do you want me to? Yeah, so Punjabi immigration actually has been a constant throughout Indian immigration through the U.S. They are one of the largest communities and have in every era there have been people from Punjab immigrating. Um, I think in the early days it was that there, it was very hard to make a living and often families would send their sons. Uh, there were many farming families and because of the high taxes levied by the British and the families being large, they would send a few of the sons to the United States to work, to send money back. Um, it, it, that was one of the original impetuses. And then I think throughout history there, have been, there has been political strife and civil strife um, with Punjabi communities being attacked. I think uh, in the 1980s was another high wave of immigration when uh, during Indira Gandhi's term when there was a lot of anti-Sikh, not just sentiment but actual violence in India. Um, so it's been different reasons, but it's mostly been economic and civil slash, slash violent. Um, and that mirrors the history of immigration to Canada as well, which is paralleled that to the United States. Uh, wow, okay. How about here? Do you know that you talk? Mm -hmm. 
So the first film, that's actually a selection by jazz pianist B.J. Iyer, um, who is a MacArthur genius. And it's a track called Abundance from his album Tirta. Um, he actually just played at the Smithsonian on Thursday. We, we hosted him and he, he played that piece. So it's, um, that, that is one of the musical selections that's in the exhibition as well. Uh, the name of the artist is Vijay Iyer, and the track is called Abundance from an album called Tirta. Yeah, go ahead. Your concept of sculpture is more like the street in the Okay. Yeah, so there were many more people than we could fit into the 5,000 square feet. I don't know, does he have a legacy here in the United States as well? All over the... Okay. Yeah. Okay, see, I didn't know that. So, <laughs> there you go. Okay, I will get that title from you afterwards. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. So there's the South Asian digital archive. South Asian American digital archive. Yeah. yeah. How many people there know about it? To what extent have you collaborated with such so many funny and others on the fact that yes, we have the exhibition that is in a way restrained by space. Yes. Whereas, you know, Sada is not restrained by space. That's right. Send us anything, we will <coughs> digitize it and send it back to you. That's right. right. So maybe I should say for people. Yeah, maybe know. you can explain a little bit about Sada just because I think what they're doing is uh, personally to me very, very phenomenal mm -hmm. in terms of collection of history. Mm -hmm. And they go back a uh, fair amount as well. That's so right. Record. So, yeah, thank, thank you for mentioning that. Um, so there is something called the South Asian American Digital Archive. The acronym is SADA, S-A-A-D-A. -A -A. Um, and they're based out of Philadelphia. They've been in existence, I think, for almost 10 years at this point. And they have been, as this gentleman mentioned, collecting and digitizing materials, everything from photographs to letters to newspaper clippings to documents. They cover the whole of South Asian American history, not just Indian American history. Um, and they actually have quite a few things in their collection from that have origins in Pakistan and Bangladesh and Nepal. Um, they, as you mentioned, this archive lives on the internet as a digital archive and it's open and accessible. They have source information and they have as much metadata as they can find um, to, uh, to accompany the actual items in the archive. And as you mentioned, it's pretty open. You can, you can send them things and they will consider them to digitize them and send them back to you and put them on the archive. It's a great repository because I can say as a curator that there is no place that this information lives comprehensively. Um, and a lot of these things will be lost, especially as um, you know people pass away. They've also, I think, collected a number of oral histories as well. They've done interviews. Um, with living immigrants about their first days in the United States. They've also interviewed family members of people that were part of the Gather Party as well as other important movements. Um, so they're a great resource. And as you said, a wonderful compliment because an exhibition lives in a physical space for its duration, but the, the beauty of the digital world is that it lives on and it can also, um, the files can be <laughs> you know, fairly large and still be stored. And if I may just pitch to all of you, they have a very interesting project which any of you can participate in. Your first day in America, yeah. you can actually record it uh, on their website, and basically you would have left this imprint for for the future forever. They have this first day in America project. If you have a photo, you want to just record a little story, anybody can do it, any uh, person. So yeah. really, very, very, very good project. I have a, I have a I should also say that the richness of both the work that I do in this archive depends on the diversity of people. I mean, I've gotten stories of Indian Americans from Alaska and rural Wyoming. I mean, places that are very hard to reach. Obviously, here in the Silicon Valley, it's a very different context, but um, they really do depend on kind of the diversity of, of all the contributions they receive. So, yeah. So, 
I work for a, a tech company called Fortinet. And you will be wondering why I'm getting and talking about it. We have, we have two trucks in the whole of US, and they go around the whole country. And it has all the equipment, the network security equipment, which goes from town to town and shows. So if, if the, the museum can do the same thing, put two trucks, and you know they go town to town, instead of having a, you know, being in, fixed in a place, it, it can go to schools and you know small towns and bigger places. I think it'll, it'll be a great thing than just, uh, you know, the, in Fremont where already Indians know about uh, you know, this. Yeah. Yeah, we should talk about that afterwards. I saw one hand here. Yeah, go ahead. Well, how do you talk about the this museum? Yeah, so, so we're actually so we're more accessible to everyone, like this idea. Yeah. We've been working with the Google Cultural Institute because they've been doing a lot of digitization of museum spaces, um, and they're going to capture the actual gallery space, but we've already put online many of the images and some of the artifacts that are shown in the exhibition, so they will live you know, in perpetuity on the website. I think it's a wonderful thing, but I also have to say that there is something different about being in an exhibition space and kind of seeing three-dimensional objects Life, especially things that are really old. So it's not an either or, it's definitely a both end. As you said, I think accessibility is very important. Yeah.